Well, uh, good morning to everyone here in Boston. It's uh, nice and early, uh, lovely morning, 7.30 in the morning here on Thursday. And for those in India, your day is winding up. Um, uh, it's 5 p.m. in India. And then there are perhaps people from other places. So welcome to one and all. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, we are very pleased to have you here. This is the fifth in our series of uh, webinars. We've been fortunate to have excellent speakers covering a range of subjects which are aligned with the Vision Aid's mission. So just a few logistical issues, uh, logistical fa um, uh, announcements about the conference. Uh, as soon as uh, we get started, we will place all the speakers on mute um, so, so that the call quality is better. But if you have questions, the chat is available. You can type in your questions in the chat window anytime. You can also use the raise hand feature in Zoom to draw our attention to the fact that you have a question. Aparna Raghuram, Dr. Aparna Raghuram is the moderator of the call. She'll be watching the chat. She'll be looking for the raised hands and she'll be calling upon you for Q&A towards the end. And uh, we'll try to take as many questions as possible. So with that said, um, I'll turn it over to Dr. Aparna Raghuram to introduce our speaker and we can get started. Good morning, everyone, and good evening, everyone in India. Uh, it is with great pleasure that I introduce Dr. Cran, our speaker today. Dr. Cran was my teacher at the New England College of Optometry, one of my favorite people from the college, a great teacher, a great clinician, and most of all, a humble and a wonderful human being. For the past two decades, Dr. Cran has been working with individuals with vision and other impairments. He is a professor at the New England College of Optometry and the optometric director at the Center of, for Eye Care at the Perkins School for the Blind in Watertown. Dr. Cran is one of the leaders in the area of cerebral visual impairment, a leading cause of uh, pediatric blindness. Much of his time is also spent on doing research and he's currently exploring a novel contrast sensitivity test that aims to be useful to test individuals with reduced cognitive function and expressive communication abilities. He has lectured extensively across the world and spent a little bit of his time uh, last year or the year before, I forget Dr. Gran in India, uh, and a good amount of time at LV Prasad during his sabbatical year. I'm sure we're gonna hear a little bit of it in his talk today. His work is recognized immensely, regionally, nationally, and internationally. We are thrilled to have him speak at our webinar series. Thank you so much, Dr. Cran. Over thank to you. you. Th thank you so much for uh, allowing me to participate. And it's wonderful to meet you all through Skype. And to those that I know uh, well, hello again. And welcome to my new friends. I am going to attempt to manage the two screens I have here and get the presentation going and let's see if I can manage that. See the presentation? Yes, we can see Dr. Cran. We can see the screen, great. Excellent, and I see all of you on the side here, and great. All right, good morning everyone. So today in a, in a relatively short period of time, I'm gonna try and share with you a lot of information about the definition of CVI and considerations around assessment and habilitation. And I wanna thank uh, you all for having me today. And I think some of the people responsible for me speaking to you this morning are listed here. And, uh, and it was wonderful. I met Ram last night as we test drove this stuff. And uh, Parner, obviously, I've known for a bunch of years. And Kristen, I've, I've met just over the phone. Uh, but uh, I think we've, we, we have a lot of common people that when you're in this field, you just meet and cross over. And it's just wonderful to work with great people. So thank you again. So um, I think what I've learned over 18 years at Perkins and working with individuals with visual and multiple disabilities is that your care needs to be patient and or parent centered in, a, in the clinic in order to maximize what you can learn from your patients. And you learn from everyone. Um, you learn from your patients, you learn from the parents, you learn from the educators that might be with the parents, you learn from all of your collaborators. There is, it is constant and nonstop learning. Um, it is, you know, I was in India, I guess now this fall will be <clears throat> already four years ago. 
And what I think I, what I knew then and what I, what I, you know, I came back and all of a sudden I was hit with a barrage of cases and it's like, oh, I'm being tested again. There's a lot more here to learn. And so it's, it's a constant, constant learning process with this population, people who are visually and multiply impaired and trying to understand all the things that can happen and how they create the world around them. So I've been really lucky to work with some great people in this photo. There's Derek Wright, a vision educator on the left there and in front and center of us is Louisa Mayer who, who worked with Davida Teller as a grad student for Teller Acuity Cards and she's, that's her proprietary field device behind Derek and she's worked on other things. And like Aperna said, where we um, are working on some contrast cards that we hope to bring um, to the market uh, in the very near future. And I've also been blessed over the last five or six years to work with um, Nicole Ross and you had Alexi Malcolm uh, lecture on Tuesday and she and Nicole are doing an awesome job in the clinic with traditional low vision patients and Nicole has also uh, has developed quite an expertise in um, pediatric low vision as well. And as, as is Alexi, uh, through her work at, at the Carroll Center. Um, I've also learned an awful lot from the liaisons to our clinic at Perkins, which um, has been awesome. And, in, and our roles at the clinic include anything from being the one and only eye doctor for the patient to serving as a supplement to the primary eye care provider. So it's not unusual for the pediatric ophthalmologist or the, or the pediatric neuro-ophthalmologist um, to refer a patient for us for a consideration for a diagnosis of CVI or cerebral cortical visual impairment. And so we can do standard low vision exams, um, um, you know, at, at Children's, for example, or even Dr. Ross at our main clinic or Dr. Malkin. You know, certainly individuals with more traditional low vision deficits, albinism, et cetera, are, are generally seen more in those clinics than in our clinic. We tend to have uh, kids who have multiple issues in our clinic and standard just um, ocular visual impairment is, is, a, is a now a pretty small percentage of the patients that we see. However, um, we still provide a range of clinical low vision evaluations. And we also, with Dr. Mayer and, and ourselves, do, do a fair amount of perimetry, which is also very important. A lot of people come to us for the time that we take with our patients and for our reports. And we try to, we collect the data as an, in an important way. And then we try to articulate in our report for the other doctors who've referred, for the vision educators who are going to be working with the child, for the parents, we try to explain everything in a way that everyone will understand it and the uh, professionals who read it will still think that we have a sense of what we're talking about. So it's sometimes very hard to find that balance in use of language and explain things. But I think parents often um, find our time together extremely valuable in what we say and how we listen in and then try to meet them exactly where they are. One of the things that I've, I learned from one of the liaisons at our clinic early on was this issue of, of, of writing in the chart, a patient is uncooperative. And I think it's really, it was this huge paradigm shift. You know, it's when you're having a party in your house and you know that you have people who like certain things or don't like or can't have certain things, you adjust your menu or what you're serving accordingly. And there's absolutely no reason why we, we're essentially the host of that eye exam. It's not their job to cooperate with us, right? It's, it's our job to create an environment in which they can be successful. And I think that's just so important to have in the back of your mind and actually in the front of your mind as you meet your patient and work with your patient. You, you need to think about doing essentially the right test at the right time and in the right way. And it means using the tools that are available and those who are with the child who might know them better than you in order to help create that environment. You know, it's not a matter of being too proud to ask, well, you know, should I try this first or that first? What do you think? 
and of course doing things like acuity with both eyes open before shoving a paddle in front of their face and getting in their personal space before they've developed a rapport with you. Again, many of our patients are multiply impaired and the last thing they need to do is someone else in a white coat coming towards them and usually that means pain, right? So we do that, we get rid of the white coat, we get rid of our ties. Um, we, the women have their hair pulled back. We're not wearing dangly earrings, right? So we create an environment for ourselves and with the individual, and we create a space that's safe, and then slowly ramp up how it is that we approach the patient and the, the way in which we collect data. And I have two examples of that here. So one way of alternatively collecting acuity is through the use of lay of playing cards. And, um, what we have here is one of our former fourth year interns holding the layer playing cards. So you can see that there, um, you know, there, there's eight sets of cards of varying M sizes from the large of 16 M all the way down to 0.63 M. And we might do it in a force, you know, we could hold up two cards and say, show me the whatever it is. And we don't, we um, just and look afterwards to see what side it's on. Or we show them just the one card and ask them to respond. And so we have the child with her teacher and um, we'll just show a bit of this and we'll see how it, um, and then we'll move on to the next video in the interest of time, but you'll just get a sense of how this plays. One, two, three. Uh, Woo, nice job picking. Nice. Ready, one, two, three. Nice. Woo! Yeah. Oh, very nice. All right, so there, were you all able to hear the video as well? Yes. Excellent. Right. Excellent. So you saw that we gave some positive reinforcement. Of course, it's always a balance of giving too much reinforcing, and then they're listening to the cues. If they chose the wrong one, they have a sense of that. So you have to be careful how the audience, if you will, those present reinforce the child, but it needs to be consistent and positive, but, but, and it needs to match where that child is. If it's gonna freak them out, obviously we don't. And <clears throat> if it's helpful, uh, then we use it. One. And here is a, a young man who came to us and we didn't have much information except it said he's blind. And his teacher, turns out to be the same teacher, several years apart here, said, no, I know he can see. And so we tried collecting acuity with him, uh, with teller cards and other ways a bunch of times. And it was clear he saw the stripes, but he, he um, was being passively aggressive. He just wasn't, wasn't fixating long enough for us to determine whether he saw it or not. So this was probably the third or fourth time we were trying it. And then we'll just... Uh, play this and I'll lower the sound to it and so we had the lights turned off and just showing him the cards that's another way of like sort of reducing the peripheral um, uh, complexity of the room and have him just concentrate on the most salient feature of the cards but having said that in doing that he's still not playing with us you know he's like looking all over and just ignoring the cards. And it was like, all right, he definitely sees what are we gonna do? So we happened to have at the time, we had like a bag of these little round cereals, Cheerios is the brand name, one of the brand names in America. And so we ended up presenting them on two different contrasting backgrounds. And if his arms were long enough, it could also be a measure of acuity, right? So if he reaches for something, and you know the size of the Cheerio and you know the distance at which he saw it, you could actually get a functional acuity. Um, so we don't necessarily believe that this was a total accurate functional acuity, but it's really certainly a test of contrast. Now watch what he reaches for. Nice. Right, so these are sort of beige cereals and it was definitely much higher contrast on the, cheer on the dark side than on the beige background that we had it on and you could hear that we're all excited and the teacher is excited that he saw it and he did had accurate reach and grasp and then he went to search for it because he missed it maybe with his hand and he really never once went to the left side so the, the question is 
is there a field deficit or did contrast make a difference? So with his back, with our back turned to him, there you go. Now watch how he touches on the, on his right side again. And will he go for the piece, a cheerio that he just touched perhaps, or the one that he can say? Right, now he goes back for the one that he knew. And do these others exist? And they really don't for him. And so this showed us how important contrast was to his life. And, the, um, and ultimately it made a huge difference for him, for his ability to move through space, for him to find food when he's eating. So using high contrast plate and placemats, using when serving food, you know, you're not gonna put white rice on a white plate, right? And maybe if you have a curry of a contrasting color to put on it, then you can see where it is. But otherwise, you wouldn't see it. You wouldn't have a white toothbrush in a white bathroom. Um, so here's a practical real world example of not only finding out a lot about the patient, but validating the teacher's assessment that he could in fact see and understanding the constraints around that and then being able to maximize um, his visual potential um, through this. And subsequently, we were able to ultimately get some acuities for him with teller cards down the road. All right. Um, so now we're going to start talking about cerebral visual impairments specifically and talk about some definitions, some causes, and how that impacts br the brain and therefore potentially functional and some uh, functional practical uh, approaches to care. And then we'll follow that with some case, a couple of cases. So a a two of, the, of my current favorite definitions of cerebral visual impairment, we'll start with the first one, vision impairment due to damage or disorder of the visual pathways and visual centers of the brain, including the pathways serving visual perception, cognition, and visual guidance of movement. That's from Gordon Dutton and Amanda Lewick. Gordon Dutton, pediatric uh, ophthalmologist in, uh, in Scotland, and Amanda Lewick, a vision educator in, in San Francisco. Uh, both have lectured around the world on this, on cerebral visual impairment. Both have published uh, an awful lot. Uh, Dr. Dutton in retirement has published more articles and books um, than most of us produce in our academic careers. Um, uh, another definition that came out of slightly more recently is this one, which is a consensus definition. So um, uh, Saki et al. Uh, did a literature search and they culled together a bunch of papers that tried to define CVI and uh, their broad-based uh, approach. I guess they have a, an interdisciplinary approach to the diagnosis of CVI at their clinic in London. And this was their consensus definition of CVI. Cerebral visual impairment is a verifi verifiable visual dysfunction, which cannot be attributed to disorders of the anterior visual pathway or any potentially co-occurring ocular impairment. All right, so um, this states a little more clearly than the functional definition that in fact, you can have both, if you will, uh, a problem with how the vision is being interpreted in the brain and then processed in the brain, as well as an ocular visual impairment or an anterior visual pathway, uh, pre-chiasm, visu uh, uh, anterior visual pathway deficit. The question is that we always must consider with them co-occurring is, is what I am seeing, does it fully explain that individual's way of using vision or not? If it doesn't fully explain it, then we need to consider the possibility of CVI. CVI or, uh, and we say CVIs plural because the presentation is along a huge spectrum. And so there are, while there are similarities of cases, each case is really very different. And that's what makes it so difficult for teaching, and that's what makes it so difficult when you're with patients in the clinic. Um, it is the number one cause of pediatric visual impairment in the developed world. 
And here you can see the incidence that's noted in, uh, was noted in 2003. And here on, on, uh, on your slide, um, you can see, this is when I was in Vijay Awada several years ago, and uh, with the, the head ophthalmologist of the unit, uh, Nuranjan um, Pahere, and um, he was just amazing to work with. And we spent uh, a couple of days uh, just sitting in his clinic with seeing patients one after the other and just really having a great time together, collaborating, obtaining information and providing uh, uh, some feedback for the, for the parents and for those who accompanied the child in terms of some next steps and practical approaches to care. It was just an awful lot of fun. And it's just a pleasure to have worked with him and his team. So causes of cerebral visual impairments. Well, anything that can cause diffuse disease of the brain uh, or can alter its structure and function, especially uh, as it's developing. And you can see here the list, it's probably an endless list of things that can cause encephalopathy. So any infectious agents, met uh, metabolic or mitochondrial dysfunction, a uh, subset of that could be hypoglycemia, a brain tumor, increased pressure in the skull, prolonged exposure to toxic elements, chronic progressive trauma. Uh, unfortunately, we have a lot of um, shaken baby syndrome uh, cases that we see in our clinic. Uh, as a res uh, you can also have brain injury as a result or brain damage as a result of poor nutrition um, or simple hypoxia noxia. Uh, as well can lead to encephalopathy. So obviously understanding uh, the maternal health and birth history and neonatal history of the child is extraordinarily important. And uh, for those in India then, I found an excellent review article um, uh, by uh, uh, Dr. Suma Ganesh at, at Dr. Shroff's Charity Eye Hospital that that really goes through a lot of these causes of potential causes of CVI and the impact they can have on the child's visual system. Neuringen uh, uh, published a paper that was published in, in 2016. Uh, well, actually I think it was published in 2018, but it was from 2016. And here you can see uh, he took a year's worth of patients in his clinic and said, okay, who are they and what's going on? What's the causes? What am I seeing? And you see here that the most common cause of, um, of CVI was a hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, right? So that's more in term individuals than preterm. Uh, about a third was undetermined, probably because of a lack of having uh, um, a bunch of medical information available to review prior to seeing the patient. And then 16% each had neonatal seizures or infantile spasms. Um, and we definitely saw some kids with significant seizures uh, during my couple of few days there. The most common presenting complaints were poor vision, uh, broadly defined, I guess, you know, they, uh, and strabismus, uh, significant refractive errors. So in a lot of kids who are, um, who have multiple disabilities beyond the, aside from vision, uh, refractive errors are a very common finding. And regardless of whether there's a brain-based etiology for their visual impairment or not, um, please, you know, make sure that you rule out simple things like refractive error when seeing these patients. Uh, it's more difficult to do retinoscopy um, and certainly often next to impossible to do automated retinoscopy on these patients uh, with either a handheld unit or the basic instrument, the autorefractors. Um, so your retinoscopy skills are definitely challenged with this population. And uh, what we try to tell all our uh, emerging optometrists is you need to learn how to look at that reflex and see how bright or dim it is and how fast or slow it is and really come up in your mind with what that answer is and then hold up a loose lens and see how close you are. And you may only get a few chances to do it, so, but over time you can get pretty good at it. Um, profound visual impairment, as you can see here, was seen in almost 90% of the patients and about 10, 11% had what, what, are, what is often termed high functioning CVI. So again, CVI occurs along a huge spectrum and 
you might think of it and as was thought of in the United States, certainly 20 to 30 years ago, uh, it was really thought of more of there's a bad visual brain, but the eyes are perfectly normal. And it took an extremely long time for most uh, professional organizations and definitions in the United States to shift away from, from that paradigm. And now again, they can coexist. And not only that, but instead of thinking and seeing somebody who with CVI who is extraordinarily low functioning cognitively, motorically, speech, and vision, we actually have many patients who are extraordinarily bright, uh, might even have excellent acuity, but can't recognize a familiar face, can't cross the street safely because their sense of motion and, a, and understanding motion is deficient. Their useful span of vision is quite constricted even though they have full fields and many other impairments that, that lead them to be functionally blind. So this issue of vision function what are they, what's their numbers, and then how do they use what they have, their functional vision, really both need to be considered and assessed very carefully. Um, and to that, you can, uh, um, they have in VJ Awada uh, at the LV Prasad Clinic there, they actually have a mo mobility and sensory simulation park. And this is a great way, since people are coming from all over the country to be evaluated there, they can actually do with their multidisciplinary team they can actually do orientation and mobility assessment in this multi-sensory area. Various kinds of, uh, of walkways, various constructions, some with high contrast, some without. Uh, there's just all sorts of scenes from a village setup, a playground area, uh, a more rural village as you can, you can see over here. And it's just really cool so that they can get a sense of how is the child using what they have. And over on the left here, you can see some of the accompanying um, uh, things that, that were accompanying his patients that had CVI. So you see the small percentage of cataracts, the percent optic atrophy, motor delay, speech delay, um, and cognitive delay. So uh, what I want to bring you quickly to is right over here, the last three months of gestation, which now more and more is, can ha is happening with people surviving um, um, in the NICUs, is you look at the brain at six months, look at a newborn. I mean, morphologically, look how different it is, and certainly in terms of development, integration, myelination, cellular migration, um, axonal connections. Look at this. It is believed that during the last trimester, several hundred million synapses are created every minute. So that happening in an artificial environment, an immature vascular system. Think about uh, what then any mild injury might do um, to such an immature area uh, of the individual. And that's in fact exactly what happens over here. So here you see the ventricles and in preemies, um, right along here, the periventricular space, that's where the uh, germinal lung are prone to injury. And it's an immature um, autoregulatory system and it can overreact. It can overreact to what's going on and, and cause extreme inflammation and cause a lot of tissue death. And it could impact both a vision, well, as well as motor, cognitive, speech, um, many other areas can be, a value, uh, can be damaged. And down here at the bottom, it could even lead to damage to the thalamus, the basal ganglia, brainstem, cerebellum, as well as reduce, reduced growth and development of the posterior corpus callosum and its connections, right? So it's not just vision that can be impaired. Um, and it's, it involves many other functions, but may not. It's again, extraordinarily variable. Full term, you think of that there's the option, there's what happens here with, with slightly more mature vascular system and a slightly more mature autoregulatory system to respond to causes for inflammation. Uh, hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy is what's seen. And here you can see that it's very diffuse or it could be more concentrated in some areas than others and could ultimately lead to damage in some of the same areas, but
but it's when that damage occurs and how severe it is that could lead to some either overlapping similar types of presentations or in fact some different presentation. So again, uh, no two children with CVI are alike, a deficit in various vision functions that's not explained by possible coexisting ocular pathology. Very important to keep in mind that in mind. So we're assessing acuity and I might assess it in a, in a very dynamic setting and then assess it in a very quiet setting or, or if they know some of their letters or shapes, isolated symbol without crowding bars versus isolated symbol with crowding bars or a full chart and having them just be reading the middle line at any one time <clears throat> that I'm showing on my computer chart and see a huge difference that really strabismus would not explain. So it's, it's not like there's a crowding effect as, as you see in amblyopia. This is far more significant. I have patients who can see 20, 30, but if you show them isolated letter, but if you show them a full chart, their acuity can be uh, five times worse than that. Um, deficits in ability to use vision we talked about or inconsistency in using their vision. So they fatigue, the visual fatigue is amazing. Um, I think there was a case that I, I presented at LV Prasad of a woman who within five minutes of collecting her acuity, she was a high school senior and, um, and she was very well spoken and articulate and within a few minutes of just trying to do acuity, she ended up almost curling up in her chair and her voice became very weak, her skin became very pale, she was exhausted exhausted and she had 2060 acuity. I mean, it wasn't like her acuity was that poor and it wasn't like she had these amazing other deficits, uh, but she clearly had CVI, which we made the diagnosis of and she actually had uh, MRIs to support the issues in the brain to lead to the higher level and some um, initial V1 stuff, but also dorsal ventral stream dysfunction that she had. Um, we're going to look at a couple of videos in a bit from Dr. Dutton's lessons at CVI Scotland. But for those of you who, well, I would say this, regardless of how familiar you are with CVI, I would strongly encourage you to browse his lessons at the cviscotland.org website. They are, writ they are produced for people who are not doctors, but um, I think all of us as doctors um, or orientation mobility specialist, or teachers of the visually impaired, or occupational therapists, anyone who works with this population, parents, will learn an extraordinarily uh, great deal of, about CVI by watching those lessons and perhaps even seeing aspects of their child or the, their caseload that they hadn't thought of previously. So a big plug for that. Um, We've already mentioned most of this already, how CVI can, can be a standalone or can be accompanied with many other deficits. All right, so let's see if this movie will load and let's watch uh, this video on dorsal stream dysfunction. The short films you're about to see are our attempt to illustrate how it might be to see the world with cerebral visual impairment. This is a condition where parts of the brain important for the creation of conscious vision do not work properly. The effects applied to the videos are based on feedback from people with cerebral visual impairment and their carers, as well as contributions from experts working in this field. Almost half of the brain is used to create a vision. Uh, Information collected by the eyes at the front and it travels to the uh, back of the brain to the occipital lobes. Um, processing initially occurs in the occipital lobes and then information then travels in two different streams, one to the temporal lobes and one to the parietal lobes. The temporal lobes are the area of the brain which store visual memory and the parietal lobes are the bit of the brain which allow us to appraise the overall visual scene and see one thing amongst uh, many. It also helps aid visually directed movement. If the posterior parietal lobes are damaged, then it can be hard to see one thing amongst many. 
It's also difficult to reach for things accurately and find things amongst clutter. Together, these difficulties are often termed dorsal stream dysfunction. Posterior parietal lobe damage and consequently dorsal stream dysfunction is a common form of cerebral visual impairment, especially amongst children. It can be very disabling, uh, but if it is recognised and habilitative measures uh, taken, the challenge of dorsal stream dysfunction can be lessened. Because it's hard to describe clearly in words what these difficulties look like, we have created these short films. The first film shows a person moving across a clear, open beach. Vision appears almost typical, until the people and their dogs come into view. Then how much can be seen reduces. They can see only one or two things at a time, with the peripheral visual world disappearing and the central window of sight narrowing and fluctuating. Once the complexity of the visual scene reduces and the people and dogs are left behind, and back into an open landscape, the visual experience becomes more typical. The next film is the same scene, but without the filter. Think about your vision as the people, chair and dogs come into view. Can you still see the trees on the right and the hill on the left? Can you see a person, the chair and the dog all at the same time? The people with dorsal stream dysfunction could not. Looking again at the first film, the filter hides so it is not seen by people with dorsal stream dysfunction. Walking on the open beach, the vision parts of the brain have less information to deal with and map. As soon as the people are seen, the brain needs to start mapping and remapping. As they get even closer, there is more to make sense of. This overloads the capacity of the brain and the central visual window narrows. When back in the open, there's less to map, the window of vision gets bigger and becomes much more typical again. Okay. <clears throat> Let's watch this video now on ventral stream dysfunction. Visual recognition is remarkable. What is your brain doing when you recognize something? Recognition is the process where your mind matches something you experienced with something you already know. Visual recognition is where the experience is something you can see, like the bird in this picture. But it is not just a bird you are recognising, you will also be recognising the colours. And you might know a bit about birds. Do you know what type of bird this is? Whilst you think, lots of pathways are activating in your mind to see if a match can be found. The match is with your memories that are mostly stored in your temporal lobes. For most people listening, on the right side are your complex memories, which include the faces of people you know, facial expressions and roots. And on your left side are more systematic memories of letters, symbols, processes and equations. The two sides work together. Cerebral visual impairment can affect recognition in many different ways and for different reasons. You might not recognise something because you can't see it clearly enough or because it is in a part of your visual field where you can't see. It might be that you can't recognise something because you can only see a part of it or none of it due to simultanagnostic reduced visual attention. And it may be due to temporal lobe issues. And recognition issues due to cerebral visual impairment are not as straightforward as being able to see something or not. Something may not be recognised because it is not known and it is not known because it has not been learned, and it has not been learned because people most commonly teach what things are largely through visual recognition, which is going to make learning difficult for those with cerebral visual impairment giving rise to problems with recognition. Recognition is, of course, conscious, and it's something we are very much aware of when somebody can't recognise something. So, as impairment of recognition can affect some people with cerebral visual impairment. It is something that is very important to look out for. All right, so that's a quick summary and introduction for some and, and um, hopefully a good tease to learn more on, on his site. 
uh, are at that site, CVI Scotland, in the lessons. On each lesson, there's the video, and then there's uh, a lot of text, uh, text to support it, and then there are some habilitation strategies that are mentioned as well. So it's a really pretty comprehensive uh, approach, and uh, it's well worth some time invested there, as well as with his and Amanda's textbook, and there are several other uh, books out there. And I know Amanda is actually working on another book for um, um, educator assessment for the range of people with CVI and thinking about then habilitation strategies. Uh, and I believe uh, the uh, American Foundation for the Blind should be publishing that shortly. Um, so what do we do as the eye doctor who are seeing a potential patient or a, pat or a patient who might have CVI? And the, the goal is to just sort of review the chart and develop a game plan. If we're lucky enough to have all the information from a bunch of uh, uh, professionals, um, here, we'll just go forward here. You know, if we can have all of these reports or as many of them as possible, and uh, we already have a sense a little bit, you know, why is the patient coming here? Um, we'll, we'll try to review the chart and try not to be as much as possible, can't help it, but to not see a giant visual system and a tiny individual. We try to see the entire individual. We try to understand the complexities of, the, of the, uh, everything that's going on. And you know, are, is there ability or, or is there limitation moving through space? Can it be explained solely by their motor function? Or is there a visual component to it? Is there a visual guided reason for it? Is there dorsal stream um, impacted? Is it as a result of poor contrast that can happen as a result of CVI or poor color vision, which can be cortically based as well as opposed to retina based? Um, so we try to ask all these questions of ourselves and see what the data is all trying to tell us. And then it's like, okay, what testing can we do in the exam room um, to sort of test the hypothesis, is there or isn't there? And, um, and that's what we're gonna talk about a little bit more in the next few slides uh, of how we kind of do that. Um, and again, all we talked about, the causes of CVI, all need to be reviewed as part of the history when we meet the patient, if we don't have that information ahead of time, or certainly making sure that we have a good understanding of it when we meet our patients. So I generally, you know, we might spend an hour or more reviewing a chart before we see a patient. And then it's like, okay, here's what I have. Is this correct? What can you, what about this? What about that? You know, what are some of the, the issues here that can help me then understand better what then I need to then incorporate as I do the evaluation? And of course, um, having a significant conversation with the family or the vision educator who might be with them both uh, about what it is that they wish to accomplish with this visit. What is it that they want to understand? And here are some of the questions that they might come in asking. Um, and some might say, is my child blind? And, and some may know what that means. And some may have a concept that that means they can't see anything. But of course, there's legal blindness, which is different than full blindness. And so we often have to have a conversation about that as well. Uh, once we have the information towards the end of the exam, we'll spend quite a lot of time talking about that. We won't have time in this presentation to have that B word conversation, the blindness conversation. One of the things we find extraordinarily valuable is the use of surveys or inventories. Dr. Dutton calls his an inventory, others call it a survey. Um, and surveys, in, in many of our opinions, are not there to make a diagnosis. They're a helpful tool in identifying children who may have uh, signs and symptoms consistent with CVI, but it's all, it's, it serves, um, I subscribe to Dr. Dutton's approach of having it serve a way of directing a history. Um, it's, it's a way of, you know, you're not gonna be able to think of everything in real time to ask those questions. So if there are surveys that are out there that parents can fill out either before coming into the clinic or while you're evaluating the child um, to then probe further is, is really important. And here are some questions Dr. Dutton might ask right straight off the top from his survey that he finds to be the most strategically important. And from that, then he would probe further, drill down using the other questions in the survey. Um, 
So there are lots of different surveys, as I said, they all have their strengths and weaknesses. And, um, uh, and it's just a matter of what you feel comfortable using. And we've used a variety of them over time. And I think we're about to switch from what we've been using for the last couple of years to, to using one we used a while back, but use it in a different way. Um, so it, it really changes with your comfort and working with this population, but very important to be, to be using them. We also then need to be thinking about detection versus resolution acuity, right? So if we're doing grading card acuity, those stripes are going to overestimate to some extent um, symbol acuity. But however, there, there are norms for that, uh, for, symbol, for, resol for detecting what side of stripes versus not. And, and still, so at least we have a set of norms. I know there are people who don't like using um, uh, grading card acuity because it, it's not the same as symbol acuity, but it's better than nothing. And it's at least as good and, and in my mind better than just you know, steady central maintains. At least you have a number that you can attach to it. Parents, you know, yes, yeah, central steady maintains or not um, means one thing to a patient. Having a number um, is certainly always more meaningful. And certainly, obviously, if this is a near acuity preferential looking, someone could be significantly myopic and still have a, a good teller or grading card acuity. So be careful about that. Leia, Leia has uh, acuity paddles, grading paddles, and she also has these hiding Heidi kind of contrast things. The problem, while they're inexpensive and accessible, the problem with them, at least for me, is that I always know what side has the, uh, the, either the stripes or what side, where's the, hot, where's, the, where's the hiding Heidi and where's not the hiding Heidi. So I'm biased and if I see some, a quick fixation to that side, whether I know whether it's the sustained fixation or not, I will err to the side of saying, okay, they saw it when they might not have. So I prefer cards like the teller cards where I don't look at what side the stripe is on before I present the card. So I'm blind to where the stripe is. I also, if the child is sitting on mom or dad's lap, try not to look at mom's eyes because she's gonna look right towards the card. I try to concentrate on the child's eyes the entire time and say, pay attention to where they are. And down below here are these um, double happy cards that we're developing for preferential looking. And then these cards, this, this object here, the, the happy face, whether it's upside down, you know, no matter how you rotate the card, it's a happy face. And um, uh, we're blind to where the, it is and we can get down to a very low level of, of contrast. Um, so that's what we use in our clinic. Uh, lots of handheld equipment. Dynamic retinoscopy is also very important and understanding accommodative function. Um, those of you, you may know Linda Lawrence, uh, Dr. Lawrence, she's a, an ophthalmologist in Kansas. She talks a lot about the use of, of low plus at near, perhaps certainly with your, some of your hyperopes or not fully correcting myopia to potentially increase um, visual attention at near in some of these individuals with CVI or reduced vision function. Um, so sometimes the change is dramatic. It can really cause a huge change in um, their visual attention. If you're helping them to accommodate you're helping visual attention, it may help sustain visual attention. It's not a panacea, but it's something to always pay attention to. And we don't have time in our clinic to do significant amount of visual perceptual testing. So we make do with puzzles and other things in order to uh, watch how they manipulate visual space and the impact of complexity on that space. And as a result, after we collect all our data and synthesize all the information, we might be talking about spectacles for either full time or near, or, or a, in a very young child, a, 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 a prescription that's more centered for near and intermediate space than for distance, right? If someone's significantly myopic and you think that, um, why ask them to accommodate even more to see it near? Their visual attention is already limited. So um, sometimes we will prescribe less than the full correction in order to allow them to more easily engage with that space. Um, we would see someone transitioning from early intervention to preschool and what kinds of accommodations do they need and we'll talk about that. So if someone, if we have observed that someone in a complex visual environment 
is um, far less visual than having them when vision needs to be engaged in a classic preschool setting where there's lots of peripheral movement, uh, things hanging on walls and boards and all over the place and just too busy, that child is not going to be visually attentive, right? So we can make some recommendations and suggestions around that to maximize when vision wants to be a primary learning media, what are the, some of the things that should be in place? And also refer for the vision educator to do things like a learning media assessment and appropriate testing for um, some habilitation strategies for CVI that, that could be beneficial for that individual. Um, also other transition points, lower school to middle school, those like this adult who, who was graduating from high school but could cross the street or recognize familiar people, how are we gonna, you know, how, are they, how is that person going to be an independent um, person in society and fully employed? What kind of strategic, what kinds of accommodations can we put in place? Where does she need to think about living so that she can get from A to B and do so independently, right? So here's someone who's not gonna be able to drive but may need to require the use of public transportation and therefore may need to be in a more urban environment or in a place with good public transportation. Someone who is nonverbal has a sense of cause and effect in family and others but is wondering about the use of vision as part of a communication system, right? And so is that appropriate for, so for someone who's nonverbal and, and what should those shapes be? And, and then what kind of direction can we give around that? Sometimes we give general direction for then the vision educator to explore and the speech and language pathologist to explore further. So um, Matt Tijan, uh, who's a vision educator in Connecticut, developed a what's the complexity kind of uh, system of assessment where, where one of his things that he looks at are the types of pictures. Does an individual do better with black and white simple cartoony pictures or does it need to be a digital picture of the real object? Which one do they respond to? Some kids respond better to one than another. You can't always tell, you can't always assume. And so you need to do some trial and error and see what engages their attention, what is the saline feature of those things that they seem to be responding to and work with that individual child. All right, so uh, I know we're sort of running out of time here a little bit. So this is a case of a young man who uh, we saw over a bunch of years who's clearly was, was premature, so check, to think about CVI. He had some oxygen deprivation at two months of age. Okay, think about CVI. On the MRI that, that, that he'd had, uh, there were changes in the, uh, on the in the occipital cortex, and he has some mild spastic diplegia, CP, and some uh, mild learning disabilities. So right away, uh, my, you, know, you would think that, that, C that CVI could in fact be a diagnosis. And mom was very aggressive about trying to understand what was happening with her child. And at that time, um, actually got a diagnosis at eight months of age, which is extraordinary, would have been extraordinarily rare in his cohort. Um, he did have nystagmus, he does have has strabismus, a little bit of optic nerve pallor. The question is, is it primary or secondary to the brain, right? Retrograde axonal degeneration, which can happen. He also has glasses for hyperopic astigmatism. He does have a bilateral inferior field defect, right? So this is something you might see with periventricular leukomalacia, a pure inferior field defect. It could be absolute, it could be relative, it could be in a, con in a, in a, in a quadrant, inferior quadrant, or it again could be a relative uh, defect where with the smallest isopter, it could be complete along the uh, below midline, or, um, and with larger isopters could be partial in one quadrant versus, or asymmetric in one quadrant versus another. Here you see is acuity. What I wanna point out here is the near acuity here where you can really see the impact of crowding. Here he is 1M at 40 centimeters, and here he is 5M at 25 centimeters. So let's round this to 20 centimeters. Essentially, when shown the whole chart, the acuity was 10 times worse, right? If you hold it half as close, the acuity is twice as big. So that would have been 10M versus 1M. That is extraordinary. That is not a result of uh, an eye turn, right? That is, not that is not strabismic amblyopia. That is the kind of complexity crowding that you see 
in some individuals with CVI. Right, so based on this, he's not legally blind. Based on this, he's legally blind. And this is more the world, right? The world isn't simplified. Um, let me just show you uh, maybe just a few minutes of this video in the interest of time. And let's get it started. This is a route that he was extraordinarily familiar with or a route that he'd been on before. The question is, does he have a mental map of it? Can he make the recollection? Can he make that connection with his dorsal stream of, yes, this is familiar, I know where I am. And it looks like our internet connection here is, well, it looks like we froze. So we'll just move on. Oh. Am I there? Yeah, we can hear you and we can see your desktop, uh, Dr. Gren. Okay, so it looks like... I can hear you clearly. Yeah, what I need to do is get my uh, PowerPoint back. Let me see if I can move. There we go. And let's see what happened here. Open. Looks like my PowerPoint crashed. No problem. Well, do you want to pause the recording for a sec? That's okay. We can just uh, edit it out after. Yeah. Uh, that's not really um, this is really a wonderful um, uh, presentation. I'm enjoying every part of it. So much information, so much of research from across the world, and of course, your colleagues. And so much to learn from what you're just showing today. It is amazing. Uh, so many complex um, uh, terms came in and then a desire to learn more about this. Well, thank you. I'm just still trying to get PowerPoint to open here. It doesn't seem to want to open. And I don't know why that is. So you know what, while I'm trying to get this open, if people have questions so far, um, um, I think well, let me just say this about that case. Let me just go on while I try to get this to open here. I don't know why PowerPoint's not wanting to play. Um, I think one of the important parts of that case was that he wasn't able to integrate the information around him. He wasn't able to visually process. And we often try to rely on a, on a oftentimes we talk about a multi-sensory approach to learning, providing that supported. And he had a cane and there were times he was taking in that tactile information and then there were times where he, it almost seemed like it was TMI. He couldn't integrate the tactile information with, or too much information. He couldn't, he couldn't take it in with um, the world around him. And it was, it was really um, uh, difficult for him to manage that. And he was really stumped. And here he was in a familiar environment and he looked like he was, it was a novel setting and he was essentially looked like he was, completely blind. And he couldn't even, when he was hearing a car, he was at a street crossing, he, the car was there, it was, at, it, was, it was idling because it was waiting for him to cross. He never even made eye contact with it and he didn't really acknowledge that it was there. We, it was unclear to the orientation mobility specialist who was with him whether or not he even saw or heard the car. So Everyone is different. There, I have a, a, a person who has 20-20 acuity, a young adult who can't cross the street on, by using vision either. Um, he has this extraordinarily ability to self-narrate and create a verbal scene in his mind. And that's how he gets through the world. He doesn't see the world visually. He sees the world with a verbal narration. It's fascinating. Um, um, and uh, maybe at another time. So I have my PowerPoint in front of me and what I want to do is I'm going to open it from here from this particular slide slide show presenter view Dr. Cran you might yeah yes we can see it now yep and so here you can see a, a, a summary of what we found for him 
And we're just, what I want to show you is this fascinating, uh, uh, so a colleague, Lotvi Meribet and Karina Bauer um, in Boston have been doing these functional MRIs and they're doing other creative things as well. So this is an MRI of a functionally, of a, of a typical person. And let me just run that for a second. And you can see the, the depth and breadth and the intensity of the connections in the brain. And then I think, yep, and here's the visual pathway, right? Primary and dorsal ventral stream. Look at all the connections to the frontal lobe, right? So V1 here, and then corpus callosum or the fasciculus, and you can see ventral stream, dorsal stream, frontal lobe right here. Um, and just, it's important to see how important the entire brain is in order to create the image of the world that we think of as reality. And we think our view of vision is of the world is the same as the next person when in fact it could be very different. So here's this gentleman, this boy, young man. Here's his brain. You, know, you can even see the cerebellum down there in the now bottom left. Look how less robust. So he's got a reasonable V1, right? But look how much thinner that dorsal stream is. Look how much less organized that ventral stream is. Look how less dense it is over here, right? So the growth of brain itself, you know, probably looked pretty good on a traditional MRI. And we have many patients with a normal MRI but extremely poor vision function, right? So there's the old saying, structure doesn't equal function. And in, in many cases with our more difficult to assess or come up with a diagnosis, patients who likely have CVI, this is more common than not. And the, boy, the, young, the other young man I was just describing, the only reason why the medical community um, finally embraced the, uh, the diagnosis of CVI was because of, of well, I, we saw him and then Latvi Meribet saw him and Karina and they did their work and their findings were extraordinary. His visual brain is quiet. I mean, totally lights out. The nothing lights up when he turns off his self-narration. It's just dramatic. All right, so then finally here, this last situation is to say that we can't we just need to be careful about coming up with a diagnosis with CVI. And um, here's, here's a situation where we saw this 12-year-old boy who had had long-standing ophthalmologic care in the community, uh, normal pregnancy, neuropsych evaluation, bright with good compensatory skills, has some vision educator services and with some accommodations. Parents are trying to understand what he can see. He seems overwhelmed in busy places, right? Sounds like CVI. With team sports, can't fully engage. So, they're playing American football. He's along the line. So I don't know, maybe think about rugby. And uh, he's sort of like in a scrum and can't really deal with it. It's too much, but in one-on-one -on -one drills, he does better. Um, some of the abbreviated findings here, you can see he's got reduced acuity. His contrast is reduced. He has nystagmus, which is variably present um, with pendular and jerk forms. No iris trans transillumination. Not that, and he is fair skinned and blue eyed and light hair, as are his parents. His parents, no history of vision impairment in the family. Um, and we played with some of our puzzles, as I pointed out in the past, and, and he did become more tactile as the task went on. He felt the edges of, of the form board itself with the pieces removed, and he needed to be asked to thoroughly scan the table for looking for a remaining piece when. Certainly on this one, he needed that to happen. So when we're observing that and seeing that, we actually did a CVI survey, and this is uh, one from um, the Teach CVI is the name of the uh, survey, and it has three different levels. And so anyway, we, we did that here, and you can see that perhaps there's lots of issues around complexity, some issues around the ventral stream, some issues around visual attention, which may or may not all of these things could be related to CVI or could maybe be explained by perhaps, who knows, a visual field. But overall here, we had significant number of answers that could be suspicious for CVI. 
Um, in terms of his visual library, parents believe that he can recognize faces, but tends to use voices more often than not. Father notes that he uses visual cues other than the face to identify people, such as their height and general outline of their appearance, their outfit. He might remember what somebody's wearing. Um, he's also very detailed about where, where toys need to be. And if you don't put them back where they belong, um, he gets very upset. All characteristics of lots of kids that I've seen with CVI and uh, full uh, and just other and relatively other uh, normal ocular functions. And um, sort of a leading question here, but unfortunately it was never done in the community. Here's his visual field. Right, so you'd expect it to be sort of way out here. And here it is for the largest isopter, it's barely 20 degrees in diameter, right? So he's legally blind, just based, at least in Massachusetts, just based on the size of his visual field. Um, and his visual field, therefore, fully explains why he gets lost in space, why he prefers to have things in a specific location. So we can generally get himself to that general area. He knows what he's gonna have to find. His visual search is minimized by having this great memory of where things are in the world around him. And so does he have CVI? Absolutely not. But I think the thing to think about here is um, we have, are developing quite a toolbox of habilitation strategies around CVI. And some of the characteristics that he has that are consistent with CVI, it doesn't mean that we can't use the habilitation strategies that we have for CVI to, for him with the understanding that he doesn't have CVI, but he has a field defect. And let me see if I can say this a little differently. We need to think about vision impairment in a holistic way. And we can't, we can't say that accommodations that we might be thinking about for someone with an ocular visual impairment are not applicable for someone with CVI or vice versa. We need to be holistic in our approach and our understanding and use the strategies that are gonna best meet the needs of that patient, right? The patient doesn't wear a label. We are labeling what's going on, but it's all brain, right? Uh, embryologically, the eyes and brain are all brain tissue, right? So it's a matter of finding the approach that works for that patient. And that's essentially where I'm gonna be leaving you here today that we need an approach that's patient sense uh, centric. We need to understand the diversity of presentation of our individuals with CVI. And we need to do our homework before we see them. And unfortunately or unfortunately, you must be a lifelong learner in order to best handle this population because the more you know, the more you realize you don't know and, um, and, and the more exciting um, it is working with these patients because you're constantly challenged. And thank you. I'm unmuting you, Dr. Purindra. Yeah. Okay. Dr. Kerr. Yes. Excellent presentation. Really enjoyed it. I have a question. When during pregnancy, because of all the advancements in imaging, ultrasounds, and others, do you do we come to know that this child is going to be blind? Um, that's a good question. I know, I know that soon after birth, um, and I guess it depends on, I guess the answer to the question is it probably depends on the extent of the damage. So if someone has significant um, uh, hypoxic ischemic event, then perhaps the ultrasound come the third trimester if the baby's still in utero, um, you can actually pick up um, the fact that the brain is not developing well and there are issues. But if it's a mild change, you're not gonna see it. Uh, but if it's a significant change, you will see it. So the, and, and the assumption that the child will be blind is a cautious one. 
I have way too many patients who said when my child was born, they did an MRI or they did an ultrasound, you know, through the, uh, it, but not through the placenta, not through the mom, but, you know, when the child's head, they did an ultrasound directly. And they said, based on this, your child won't walk, won't talk, won't see, or whatever they said. And then there's the child. Um, and a, a perfect illustration of that, oh, a couple of years ago, we saw we were reading a chart and the child had significant hydrocephalus and, and the MRI image, the brain was literally pasted against the skull. It looked like a complete vacuum in the skull. And this um, three and a half, four year old kid walked into the exam room and spoke. It was unbelievable. So to me, the take home message there is Yes, structure sometimes equals function, but not always. And I think we as clinicians need to be very careful about what we say to our parents of, of these infants and young children. We can say, and, we, and even sometimes what the parent will hear and what the doctor says can be very two different things. We've all been there, right? So we can say it's not likely that or we're concerned about, but it doesn't mean that they don't hear that my child won't do A, B, C, or D. So having that conversation with our patients um, is, is very important about how we say it and what we say. But generally speaking, yeah, when you see a lot of damage to the brain, you can expect that there's gonna be uh, involvement in, in perhaps more than just the visual system. Thank you. Thank you so much. Dr. Cran, uh, just for your information, Mr. Puran Dang, who asked the question, is the chairman of Vision Aid, so just to make a connection. Well, Thank you. Thank you for your work, for your support of the organization. Dr. Kran, there's one question on the chat. I'll just read it. When a child has a brain lesion in the occipital lobe, he would lose color function. How can these CBI children identify red and yellow colors? That's a good question. Um, not all CBI children can. I know there's... Uh, there's the work of a particular person who feels that red and yellow or are particularly salient for individuals with CVI. But the question is, this isn't, uh, it's, not, it's, not, it's not necessarily binary, right? There are some kids with CVI who have damage to the occipital cortex who have color vision. And there are some individuals with CVI who in fact don't have color vision with damage to the occipital cortex. It just depends where and how severe. And so um, I would say that um, I would say that I would simply check it uh, as best as possible and see what they respond to, see what kinds of toys and colors. I wouldn't a priori say use red toys, use yellow toys, use mylar of a specific color, present them with a, a, a a range of things and see what they tend to gravitate towards and use those. Um, <coughs> using color for contrast when you're not sure about whether or not there's a color vision deficit can also be problematic, right? Just think about the typical color deficit that, that men are 10 times, boys are men 10 times more likely to have than, than women, girls, and that's red green. If you pick a dark hue of red and a dark hue of green, right? So they could appear the same shade of gray. So um, I often talk to parents about, when they ask about color, certainly black and white are the most contrasting, but no one wants to paint their house or have black and white around their house as the sole way of having things, right? So that's not gonna work. But think about when you, th when you go to the hardware store, well, in the days when we used to be able to go to a hardware store, um, and you'd go to the color, the paint area, they have these paint chips, right, that, that go from a very light hue of a particular color to a very dark hue. So we talk about matching a light hue with a dark hue, almost regardless of the color, but obviously you wanna make it appealing for those with um, good color vision. And so that's what we talk about often for contrast um, and see what happens with that. <clears throat> it is some trial and error. And um, some kids seem to respond extraordinarily well to it, and some kids don't. And so for some kids, it's, it's like, I think you can be misled. What is it besides the color that they're attracted to? Is it always a similar tactile feature that they're responding to versus the color? 
Is it a sound that it's making? So, so don't just be looking at what the object is visually. Think about the other attributes of that object and how it might engage their use of vision or not. Dr. Grant, that was a fantastic presentation. I'm sure this is like a treasure trove for us at the, at the organization and, and we'll be hosting it at the site as well. I have one quick question. Uh, at least these days, um, the CVI is like such a terminology that's so commonly used. Um, so this high functioning CVI is something that we are seeing a lot because now occupational therapists, the TVIs are more familiar with this now. They see these kids in the classroom who, who have these subtle deficits. And sometimes we get these referrals saying, oh, you know, the parent advocates for it or because the school has advocated and said, you know, there are subtle issues. It could be learning issues. It could be subtle way of processing things. And they come to us and, and they want a diagnosis of a CVI sometimes. And these are high functioning kids and I can empathize. I understand the dorsal ventral route. I speak to them about it and I say, yeah, these are subtle features. I cannot say you have a CVI, but there may be subtle ways in how your dorsal, like, you know, your brain is processing this information. But how do you deal with, with that sudden increase in awareness to CVI? Um, yeah, no, that's a difficult question to answer. Uh, and let me see if I can ap approach it, and I'll try to approach it in a couple of different ways. Uh, I think, do, well, let's, let's look at it this way. Do I think that there are times where CVI can be overdiagnosed? Uh, and the answer is, perhaps. Do I... Am I aware of the fact that there are many people who are quote unquote high functioning CVI who are struggling immensely and are being dismissed by the medical community, who are extraordinarily isolated as a result, whose parents are extraordinarily angry at the medical profession for not listening to the deficits and fully understanding the deficits these individuals have? Um, you know, the more of I've gotten involved with this, the more of those emails and conversations I've had with families over the years and more and more so recently. Uh, I mean, I've been aware of a few of just over the last two weeks who've reached out. So I think there's a lot yet we still don't understand about these individuals who appear to be visually normal and are making extraordinary modifications unbeknownst to us about how they create the world around them and the demands on their processing for doing that while trying by, by all, for all intents and purposes, appearing normal um, is, is, is sad and remarkable that they're able to do it, but sad that this is the only way they know how they see and assume the rest of the world sees the same way. And sad that we don't have enough specific tools yet to quickly identify them and identify them earlier in their lives. So, um, it's hard at times. It's difficult at times to, you know, you want to say, God, I, I can't, you know, mom here, you know, you know, mom is overreacting or, or the vision teacher is looking for something that's really not there. And then the question I face in the exam room, if I can't fully identify it, but oftentimes these surveys leave the way to helping to identify it, um, even though they don't make a diagnosis. Um, what I find though is, do they have characteristics that are not otherwise explained? And whether you make a formal diagnosis or not, can you at least say, all right, here's a tool bag here. Here's a box of tools that might be helpful for your child based on what I'm hearing and what I could observe. At least have an evaluation by a vision teacher or an orientation mobility specialist who's open to looking at approaches that are consistent with this diagnosis, but maybe not uh, we're not ready yet to make the formal diagnosis. I, I, that's really where I'm at with that. Uh, if I can just jump in, uh, I'm Lubaina. I'm a pediatric occupational therapist and I work in the public school setting. And Aparna, to answer your question, you know, I often see kids that I would suspect they're high functioning, they have a diagnosis of a learning disability, you know, in different areas and I work with them and 
I think the bottom line for us as OTs in a public school setting is really about the accommodations. I think that is key to serving these children regardless of the diagnosis. Uh, because that's where they succeed. So whether you make them, you know, I, I approach it from a visual perspective and will create accommodations. The special ed teacher creates them from a learning perspective. Uh, but these kids are very successful given these accommodations. Uh, you know, that's one point. And the second point I want to point out is um, I've had kids with severe, severe trauma uh, in the public school setting, you know, shaken baby syndrome and so on, with significant brain damage, it has never stopped to amaze me how plastic that young brain is. So I think Dr. Barry referred to that uh, when he said, you know, it, it defied that one example that you gave, it defied what you saw when you looked at the MRI and then you looked at function. Uh, so that's just one thing, you know, I want to point out for the team out there working with young children, uh, with a visual diagnosis, whether it's CVI or something else, is don't go by that MRI, go by function and create those accommodations because that's really what matters in the end. I, I totally agree and I hear your passion in your voice and it's great to hear that. Um, I think that, I think it, it takes a team, it definitely takes a team and, and we are making artificial barriers for the care of many of our patients with multiple needs, right? If you don't, if I as the eye doctor don't give that diagnosis of CVI or at least advocate strongly for it, then the expertise of a vision educator in that child who might be highly verbal but low performance scores on an intelligence test, which is often associated with dorsal stream dysfunction but not always, um, and or perhaps some ventral stream dysfunction, then, um, you know, that expertise is going to be gone. There's no one there who's going to integrate that information. So um, we, have to, we have to have this sort of it takes a community to raise a child approach. And, and everyone needs to be collaborating about, you know, the OT, you guys are doing what you're doing, the special educators doing what they're doing, but we can't be in silos. We need everyone at the table collaborating to maximize and create an environment where that child can be successful. Just like I try to do in the exam to get the information, the same thing needs to happen in their scholastic setting, in their home, in their community. I do agree. And I just want to put in a plug for our next week's uh, talks. One is by an OT who is an orientation and mobility specialist as well. Uh, and the second talk is actually by a speech pathologist who works at Perkins and she will be addressing accommodations. So I just want to tell the group out there that we're going to have some follow-ups to this wonderful presentation that Dr. Cran put together, which has really given us a good foundation to understanding CVI and the challenges faced by these students in the real world. So do stay tuned. Thank you, Lubana. So those talks are on Tuesday and Thursday, and you will get a mailing if you participated in the webinar. But thank you for mentioning that. Are those both in the morning again, like this week? Um, I believe so. Right, mm -hmm. Ram? I think so. Yes, yes I believe so. And uh, we will send you the timing. I, I'm not 100% uh, sure, but we'll I look up the timing and send you an email, Dr. Grant. Thanks. Yeah, but I just echo what uh, Lubaina and Aparna said. This was an outstanding talk, a treasure trove of information. I'm going to have to watch the recording at least once more, if not <laughs> several times. And I'm sure I've been seeing a lot of chat uh, conversations, all of them appreciating your talk. So, so thank you very much for taking time and joining us. Uh, and, I'm, and I'm really sorry that that last, that video crashed there, but I think we um, were thank able you. to get through it all. So thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Cran. I need to leave. I have a patient to go see, but thank you so much. I cannot thank you enough for your time and for the short notice we gave you to do this talk also. I really, really appreciate it. Well, you're all very welcome. It was a pleasure to speak to you all today. And for those starting their day, have a good day. For those ending, have a good evening. <laughs> Excellent. I'm going to stop the recording.